Good evening, and welcome to UCSD Conversations. I'm Mary Walshock, Associate Vice Chancellor for Public Programs at the University of California, San Diego. It is my pleasure to introduce you to some of our faculty and their cutting edge research. Please join us for an enlightening evening of conversation. Tonight, we'll visit the Thornton Hospital Kitchen with Executive Chef Robert Ashley and remember acclaimed artist and UCSD professor Italo Skanga. But first, Muir College Provost Patrick Ledden in conversation with Eduardo Macano, the new dean of UCSD's Division of Biology. Thank you, Mary. My guest today is Professor Eduardo Magano of the UCSD Division of Biology. Professor Magano is by training a physicist. In his career, he's a distinguished neurobiologist, and he is recently arrived here at UCSD from Columbia to become the founding dean of the Division of Biology here. Eduardo, thank you for being here. Thank you for the invitation. It's a great pleasure to be here. Glad to have you with us. I, I have the feeling that if you look at all of the things that were going on in this new position, uh, consolidation of a already very distinguished faculty, the prospect of serious growth over the next 10 years, uh, a very strong biomedical, biotechnological, biology environment here in San Diego, uh, must have been a very attractive thing to come here. By all means. Um, it's, you know, a situation where uh, we have a major university, which is very young, which was started largely as a science campus, with uh, top-notch people brought in to really set the tone. And that tone has, for the past 40 years, remained uh, the driving force of UCSD as a place of excellence. And it has grown, but it has grown in a way that has maintained that initial excellence. So it, it definitely was a very attractive possibility for me to think about how to bring uh, the changes that are being driven uh, by the demographic increase in size of uh, student populations and so on, and try to participate in the bringing forward of uh, the biological sciences at UCSD into this century of, of biology. Which it probably is going to be, I mean, the century of biology. People are saying that fairly regularly now, but it seems almost inevitable. Well, it doesn't mean that uh, we've uh, finished with physics <laughs> or mathematics or philosophy I'm or anything else. Please to know that. Right? <laughs> um, but it does mean that we've uh, sort of, there's a constellation of things coming together from the point of view of, of technology, of the quality of the thought that is being put into biological system analysis and, and uh, uh, the ideas that are floating around. And of course, the great advances of the past 30, 40 years in our understanding of sure. genetics. Sure. But it's also, is it not the case that all the other subjects, mathematics, physics, chemistry, have all created the ability to do things in biology that didn't exist uh, 50 years ago or even less than that. I mean, well, it will allow us to answer questions we couldn't have answered before. I think it's worth uh, remembering that the, uh, the great revolution of the 50s and 60s, 1950s right. and 1960s, uh, in molecular biology was driven by the infusion of a new kind of thinking that mainly physicists brought to, to biology who took an approach which was much more uh, one of trying to understand the mechanisms of biology as opposed to the more classical descriptive taxonomic uh, taxonomic uh, sure. you know the complexity of, of biological systems was thought uh, to be best uh, described let's say by looking at comparatively at species at sure. organs at cells and you know trying to tell us what richness there was of form and function. But when the physicists came in, they said, well, let's try to understand the mechanisms. And I'm not saying by any means that biologists didn't contribute a lot, but of course. It's, it was this kind of new paradigm. Mm -hmm. you know, how do you think about this in a different way? And as you point out, I think we're in the confluence now of uh, a lot of different kinds of influences from mathematicians, from computer scientists, from uh, chemists, from physicists, and even from philosophers who are giving us a lot of uh, 
ideas about the mind and what might be uh, the relationship between mind and the brain itself. So there is a richness of approach mm -hmm. that um, I think will bear fruit over the next 50 years. Making, making this years. the century of that, that progress, yes. Yes, right. but biology writ large. Okay? Yes, it's, of not, course. it's not a narrow uh, yes. yeah. focusing on yeah. some area. It's actually biology from viruses and prions, a very tiny, mm -hmm. to uh, biology of uh, populations, sure. of, of humanity. Yeah. Well, we have that here at, at, in our biology department. I was like thinking in preparation for this conversation, just some of the my colleagues in the biology department who are doing everything from computers, analyses of uh, species flow and prairie restoration, things of that sort, to, yes, to the, to the origins of life. Uh, Chris Wills is working on uh, the, uh, yeah, the virologist. I mean, it, it's quite an astonishing array of problems and puzzles. Certainly, certainly. The, uh, the population of, uh, of biology oriented scientists and thinkers in, on this campus is quite astonishing. It's, uh, you know, one doesn't have to go into national or international ranks to, uh, to just say that the, the richness, the depth of thinking uh, and the breadth of thinking about biological issues is uh, as good here as anywhere, perhaps better than in most places. It is- That's uh, very exciting. Yes, no, no, it's, of course, it's a very exciting campus to be at because of that, and um, uh, a, a place where one can contemplate how biology will change over the next 10, 25, 50 years. And also to help it do that. I mean, to play a role in that change. Well, that's the challenge, of course, of is course. playing a constructive role. <laughs> yeah. there's, um, there's a role which is to maintain and to keep the momentum but there's also a role which I think is perhaps the most exciting to try to help define the new boundaries, of course. look of course. for right. where the edges are, yes. right. the boundaries, right. and then right. try to approach right. them. Right. Because that process itself creates change. That's I mean, just the looking. Yes. Just thinking outside of the envelope, you know, looking uh, at, sure. at you sure. know, what right. might be the consequences of yeah. trying something totally crazy. Sure. Um, but you have to be in an environment where that's tolerated, supported, encouraged, all of those things. Certainly all of that helps. Uh, being uh, out in the wilderness, uh, essentially uh, with, with just limited by yourself, is not, no, of course not. Right. nearly as exciting right. as being in a place where, as I said, the confluence of, right. of a variety of yeah. factors really yeah. makes yeah. it a very exciting place. I, I have the feeling that many science, we, we often talk about science and the way it's going to affect humankind or do good things, cure diseases, whatever. But I have the feeling that what makes many of the scientific community spend those 60 hours a week in the lab isn't that they're going to ultimately have that kind of impact, but that they really want to unravel that secret, that there's a puzzle. Mother Nature has given us this wonderful book of puzzles and by golly, I would like to solve one. It, 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 do you think, I mean, you're, you've, you've done that. No, we, mean, have, we have the whole spectrum. Of course. Yeah. I mean, we have the scientists who do this just for the love of it, and <clears throat> who look forward to contributing sure. to the you know, breakthrough of uh, some new ideas. And, so. and we also have uh, the other end of the spectrum, people who are very oriented towards what is called uh, transitional research, mm -hmm. trying to, you know, what we call uh, sort of from the, from the discovery to the uh, bedside of right. a patient. Sure. Sure. The application. The application. Right. And of course, in this atmosphere, in this environment in which the biotechnology industry is, uh, is one of the major growth areas, there is a tremendous interest in that end of, mm. of, yes, uh, of the course. spectrum as of well. Of course. But I think everyone realizes that, that this is a, a f kind of a feed-through sure. system in which those that look at the very basic science, at the very elementary issues of how cells uh, are put together and how they work, are, they will illuminate the processes that then the transitional sure. Sure 
base so applied researchers sure. are going to use sure. to come up sure. with the right drugs and the right sure. approach and sure. the sure. right therapy. Right, right. But but you have to have that basic or well, I think there's nothing to flaw. Yeah, there is, uh, you know, there are places that concentrate on the very applied. Of course. And of course, of course. With, uh, with the World Wide Web and with the uh, quickness of, of dispersal of information, you technically don't have to have everything in the same place. Mm -hmm. But it is my feeling that if, if you can interact uh, not just in virtual space, but in real space. Sure, over a cup of coffee. Over a cup of coffee, that uh, you know, that that free free reign, mm -hmm. free thinking. Of course, no question. Uh, free no interaction question. is no you know, question. It, it's it's interaction in real time, as opposed to sitting there and sure. typing something sure. and waiting yeah. for a response. That's also but, valuable. But well, the, of course. But, but the talking to yes. each other, sitting in the lab, to say, "Well, I tried this. You don't think? What do you think? We got to organize this." Yes. Yeah. 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 So I having the mass here is very important, but also. I have a sense that the community here is, I mean, as you said, UCSD, but there are also other local universities, but there's the Salk Institute, the Scripps Research Fund. I mean, there are a whole series of important players in the biology world. Is that, does that, that, that helps a great deal, I think. Absolutely. I, I think uh, per capita, the scientific community here is, is um, better than anywhere. Really? Uh, you know, in New York City, there are many universities, sure, medical many schools, major ones, sure. medical schools, sure. and so on. Sure. So there, you would expect to have a very high concentration. Here, uh, between, as you mentioned, the, the Salk, the uh, the Scripps, sure. UCSD, Burnham, right. and all of sure. the biotech industry, sure. and so on, I would say, I would venture to say that we have a much higher percentage than New York City yeah. in terms as a of percentage of the focus. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah it's. Of course, it's a small pretty intense. town. No, but it's still pretty But it's intense. intense. Yes. yes, right, right. Yeah, yeah, right. We do more than research, although research is very important. Uh, we also teach. Well, I, you know, I think the, the, the model that we really value is the research university as the place where knowledge is not only created, new knowledge, but also where it is imparted. Right. And I think that being educators, basically, we get a tremendous uh, feedback from teaching that uh, that some people just don't quite realize uh, the, the value of this. Oh, right. I have always felt that that um, if I really understand something, then I will be able to teach it to a freshman at, at sure. a place like UCSD. Right. Right. If I can't explain what I'm doing to a freshman at UCSD, who's a very bright individual, mm -hmm. then I really don't understand it. You have so to think it through yourself. My yeah. sense is that teaching mm -hmm. is a is a critical function that we, we have to right. have as, as scholars and, yeah. and scientists, yeah. and I think that in addition having uh, the being a, a cutting edge research uh, institution is very valuable because it brings the individuals who have the curiosity, the students yes. who really want to of course. to move to the boundaries, of to really know of what's going yes. on, of course, um, yeah. and what's going to be coming sure. as well. Yes and no. to participate in, the, in this whole enterprise. I, I, I know a lot of students here in my job as provost. I get to meet a lot of them. But yes. I think among the most excited students, undergraduate students, that I know are mm -hmm. biology majors. Not all biology majors. I don't mean to say that. There are some who probably aren't. But among the most excited students are a very high percentage of biology majors. There's, I, I think it's the excitement of the discipline which is conveyed by the faculty mm -hmm. that they're involved in this extraordinarily interesting enterprise, but also that they themselves they maybe came here to get engaged in that. All right, and then they see, they look out and they see what some of the prospects are. They work in labs. They work over at the other places that we talked about. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and, and I think that that's, that must be an exciting place to be a teacher. I mean, I teach the mathematics, but I, teaching the biology would we be more exciting. We actually thank you for <laughs> teaching the mathematics to <laughs> those biologists who usually will tend to run away from mathematics. But no, it's certainly, it's certainly the case that um, the quality of the student population here is tremendous because the place is so attractive. Yeah. So it's exciting. You know, we have, uh, we have such a high number of applicants that we we can pick very sure. yes. carefully to, yes. to get, you know, it's not that we want to pick just a 4.2 sure. grade point average student. That's not the point. 
but we can actually select those whose curiosity comes that's, through. That's the key. Who we know are going to, in fact, uh, benefit that's from being key. in a place where, where you're not fed something, but you're asked to think. Right. I, yeah, I, I talked to someone here, a visiting scholar here, several years ago, uh, was in fact was in, in biology. And he said, this was a pretty remarkable place, he thought. I don't mean to brag, but he worked in a lab. He says he would be in the lab at you know, 10, 11 o'clock at night on a Saturday, and there would be some undergraduate students. He said you'd have to kick them out to close up the lab. He'd never been to any place where there was that sort of level of, <laughs> kind of genuine enthusiasm. He was pretty yes. taken by it. I, I hope that that's still true. I think it is, actually. Yes. No, yeah, no, I, think, I, I think it is. I'm, do do you see the discipline, the teaching of the discipline, changing over these next... Uh, well, I mean, there we are... Do we keep changing the major because the field is changing? Well, there is an interesting conundrum, which uh, it's, you know, it's a, a problem, I think, in general in the teaching uh, profession. And that is that the expansion of knowledge and information is so great that you have to become basically a selector. You have to decide what is important, what is going to be uh, the best, the most productive subject uh, subject matter in terms of actually learning and understanding the field. And one of, one of the biggest problems we have is that if you want to maintain, you know, essentially a four-year undergraduate uh, uh, course of study, that um, at least in biology you have to essentially take maybe 10 percent of what is very exciting knowledge and say, well, that's what I'm going to have to That's all we have time for. It's all we have time for, yes. You know, prime time, but sure. still, it's, it's mm -hmm. limited. And I think, you know, in talking with my colleagues, we find it very difficult to define the great biology. Like, you know, many uh, liberal arts universities like, or colleges like Columbia College in, in, at, at, uh, in New York City have these survey courses called the great books or sure. the great thoughts. Great ideas, right. Mm -hmm. And um, there's always a political struggle as to which 10 books of are the great books. Of course. Right? Now, in biology, um, we're getting to the point where defining which are the 10 great experiments sure, or the 10 great ideas sure, sure. Uh, is difficult because yes, there's sure. so much competition. Sure, sure. And uh, as, yeah. as we expand that, uh, it, it becomes even worse. Sure. But, you know, I think the difficulty in, in teaching science is that you don't want to just teach content. Of course you not. You want to teach how we do sure. science. Process. And sure. they, that's where the mathematicians come in. We yes. need to have the training in of mathematics. Course. We sure. need to have the training in chemistry, physics. in physics. Of course. And then we can, in fact, uh, uh, deal with the biology in a very sure. fertile, sure. In, sure. in a very fertile sure. background. Sure. But that also means that the students have even less time because they have to learn all, all of these other, other tools. Sure, you know. sure. But, but on the other hand, I've always had the theory somehow that, uh, assuming that the people made a reasonably intelligent choice, it doesn't matter what the ten ideas are. Because, in fact, the person who goes on, if they have learned the skills, if they've learned yes. the process, th th it will change anyway, and they will be able to deal with that well, change. Well, I, I agree, but not entirely. Well, that often because, happens with me. Well, no, no, no you know, no. Let's, let's consider what a person, an educated person, needs to know these days. I believe that everyone who has, I mean, probably even high school education, needs to know what is DNA, what is a gene, mm -hmm. and what is the significance of the fact that variations in genes can lead to abnormal or at least uh, diverse conditions. Mm -hmm. When you read an article about the fact that someone has been pardoned after being on death row because DNA fingerprinting shows that they were not guilty, I think you need to know what that means. What is sure. DNA fingerprinting, sure. right? So I think there are some subjects that have to fall among those no, ten No, oh, I, I don't disagree with that. No, it's, right. it's in a sense the absolutes versus the relatives. Sure, sure, right? sure. And, you know, just to name another issue that we are very deeply engaged in politically and uh, ethically and so on, stem cells. What are stem cells? People have to know what that means. Sure. 
Now, if they don't understand that a stem cell is a cell that is essentially capable of developing into anything uh, and have some appreciation for why that is important, then they're not informed well enough to have an opinion. And uh, since we're a very political society and we choose uh, between one president and another on the basis of what they say about issues like that, we need to understand that. Absolutely. So, no, no, absolutely. Uh, you know, you can, you can be selective uh, on the basis of many different criteria, yeah. one of which could be what is politically important about biology. Or, or socially important. Or socially important, right. right. In fact, some people would say that today, granted what's going to happen over the next uh, 50 years, that the best education would be to be a biology major supplemented by an appropriate array of philosophy and history and arts courses and so forth. I mean, that that would be the liberal education of the 21st century. As a mathematician, I would partially endorse that. <laughs> no, but I think it's, I think no, I, no, we're I, saying I, the same I, thing. I yes. Think, uh, no, that, no, I, that I, if the, this whole vast set of puzzles develops over the next five to 10 years, what, what, what do you see those developments being, and how do you see them having an impact, say, here in San Diego on UCSD? I mean, do, do you see that in, in, in our role in this? I mean, that's a very broad question. Yes, it is a very broad question. It's, um, you know, one, again, one, one always has to be selective, of course. Okay. One has a limited amount right. of, of time, time for almost anything. So I would say that, that um, what will happen in, at UCSD in the next uh, 5, 10, 15 years as part of the growth that yes. we envision is an enhancement of our interactions with our environment. I mean, UCSD, like other elite research universities, has tended to insulate itself, you know, to go about its own business sure. in, a, sure. in, a, in an sure. environment sure. in which, sure. you know, People might know that you exist, but sure. you know, and they say, well, there is, there's the ivory the tower up in the hill, there, up in the hill or whatever. Um, but I think we're getting to the point where the knowledge that we create uh, and the need for our product, which is our educated students, besides uh, the new knowledge, is such that our interfacing with our uh, local environment in San Diego is going to have to be a lot, uh, a lot better. A lot, a lot more thorough. A lot, yes, right. more thorough. I think yes. we need to make, uh, make the knowledge that we're involved in creating and uh, the understanding that we're developing. We have to impart that to our community. And in addition to that, we need feedback from that community, particularly because we are so science and technology oriented and we are feeding into the local industry. We need to know what they want. Sure. What do they sure. need? Sure. Do they want a biologist who knows more mathematics, or they want one who knows uh, a little more managerial, sure, uh, of course. you know, interpersonal of course. skills? Of course. These mm -hmm. things are, you know, we've tended to be very insular sure. and say, we know how, we to, know how to do this. We know right. how to right. do this. Right. Don't, don't come and tell us what to right. do. But I right. think we're getting to the point where right. they, it's got to be a two-way street. So. And, and also, just to supplement that, to convey our excitement to the community about what we're doing and Definitely. to hope that they participate in that. Definitely. I think one of the issues that, that has become uh, very critical these days is, uh, has to do with information. People are yes. very interested yes. in knowledge. Yes. They want yes. to get it. They want yes. to understand things. Yes. Yes. And we're here to tell them. That's right. You know. And to help. Absolutely. Right. I mean, they, they may not appreciate everything that we think is important. <laughs> But if we don't tell them, how, 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 do, how can they make the choice? Right. How can That's they make right. the choice? Yes. On that uh, optimistic note, I'd like to thank my guest, Professor Eduardo Macano of the UCSD Division of Biology, for a very engaging and optimistic conversation. Next on UCSD Conversations, a look at what's cooking in the Thornton Hospital kitchen with executive chef Robert Ashley. <laughs> hospital industry was ripe and ready for somebody to come in with an artistic flair 
and present the patients with a menu that they would be more accustomed to getting if they were at home or at a restaurant than they were with their typical hospital food. Hospital food, generally speaking, is very bland and it's mostly a frozen food item that's just been reheated. It usually sits too long on a steam table and it's old and tough and dried out and by the time they get it, it's cold. And um, I had an opportunity to come in here and uh, design menus and I do design the menus for um, all of our patients. I work very closely with my colleagues and um, we run menus for people with dysphagia who can't swallow, for renal patients who have protein limitations, for cardiac patients who have salt and uh, fat restrictions. Um, we have numerous menus that we run, but our standard menu for the typical patient is a restaurant quality menu we do grilled mahi-mahi with a ginger lime sauce. We do prime rib, um, all sorts of very nice dishes that you would get in any restaurant in town. So it's been really interesting being a hospital chef and having a, an opportunity to participate in that cutting edge uh, time where hospitals were competing for bed share. And one of the ways that they found that they could do that was to hire real live chefs and uh, have a, a cuisine that patients would uh, want to come and eat here for even if they weren't sick. I was uh, actually one of the very first patients at Thornton Hospital and uh, I walked into the atrium and I looked around and I said, whoa, I would love to be the chef right here and I started making inquiries into finding out about uh, the situation here at Thornton Hospital. Eight interviews later I was offered a position. I've been here uh, uh, going on six years now so it's just been wonderful. I think I've been written up uh, in the Union Tribune as having the largest private cookbook collection in San Diego. I have, I, I believe, 867 cookbooks in my collection right now. Uh, we are able to go through those cookbooks and pull out new fresh ideas and incorporate them into our cafeteria menu. As far as the patients are concerned, I wrote a menu that we have pretty much stayed with for the last couple of years because in this day and age, hospital patients don't stay very long you're in and out. You might have major surgery and you'll go home in three days as opposed to staying for 10 days like it used to be. So um, we have a one week cycle and uh, I've kept this cycle in place for a couple of years now because our patient satisfaction, which is critically important to gauge the success of our operation. Patients are given a, a full-on report card and they gauge us for the taste of the food and the quality of the food and, and the temperature of the hot food and the temperature of the cold food and the service, the, the quality of our service. And uh, it's very detailed questionnaire. And our patient satisfaction here at Thornton Hospital has just been incredibly high um, for the last five years. So I've been very uh, happy going with the menu that we've had in place. If we have a typical census of 70 patients a day, we put out three and a half meals per day per patient. So we're doing about 250 patient meals per day. And they're all individually plated up with a garnish, with a, a fresh vegetable and a starch and an entree and a sauce, just like you would have in a restaurant. Uh, we also have um, a cafeteria that is quite famous in the community because we have um, people who come from all of the surrounding areas uh, to eat here at Thornton Hospital, even if they're not a patient or a relative of one. So we serve about uh, uh, maybe close to a thousand meals a day in our cafeteria. So we're talking about 1,250 or so meals a day. It's a big operation. I take apprentices from the culinary schools and they work with me. I currently have uh, Sylvia Eshelman, who I brought over on a work visa from Switzerland. I have Daniel Moss of uh, the culinary program at Grossmont College. Uh, Fred Lee, who was uh, one of the top students at the California Culinary Academy. Ben Martinez, who's my executive sous chef, who's been with me for many years. I wouldn't trade him for any chef in, in La Jolla or San Diego if you put a gun on my head. Uh, so I have these top-notch people that I've been able to surround myself with who are studying to be professional chefs and they give it all of their passion and all of their um, effort to make really creative dishes and uh, work very closely with me. It's, it, it's tremendously uh, fruitful to see these people grow and 
mature and I get them chefs positions throughout the community and uh, it's another thing that I've been uh, able to do here at Thornton Hospital that I might not be able to do if I was working at a quote restaurant. Okay Ben, um, why don't you tell me exactly what we have going here? Okay, what we have going here is a chicken tortilla pie. Mm -hmm. um, on the bottom of the, t the pan I have a hominy, white hominy and tomato uh, base. The tortilla is going on there, flour tortilla. We also have a tomatillo and uh, Anaheim chili sauce that's going on top of that, which is going to be covered by black beans. Now, we like using a lot of beans and chicken and things like that here because uh, excellent sources of protein without having all the fat. As you can see, Sylvia's working over here. We're cooking whole body chickens, and we pluck the meat off the bones ourselves as opposed to buying the processed product and we pull all the fat off it. You got the chicken breasts and things in there. Legs, thighs, dark meat, everything's great in there. Mm -hmm. um, then we're gonna cover up with another flour tortilla. What we do with these tortillas, of course, is that we take them and we put them right on the grill here. It's really kind of neat. We just turn our oven on, turn it on, turn our oven on, and we take the tortilla and we toast it right here and bring out a nice flavor from it. This is really uh, a very authentic way of working with tortillas. If you go down to Mexico or Latin America, you'll see that they put their tortillas right on an open fire. And uh, this is what we do. You can smell the aroma. It smells beautiful, doesn't it, Ben? Yes, it does. And then we have our toasted tortilla that uh, Ben's has laid down here. And um, it looks really nice. We have another way of using our tortillas here. And uh, that we can see Fred Lee. Fred was my apprentice from the California Culinary Academy. He came to me from uh, New York, and um, he's actually uh, my banquet chef now. So, what, Freddie, why don't you explain what you have going here? I'm doing a chicken pesto tortilla wrap. Mm -hmm. uh, we're using Roma tomato tortillas for the nice orange effect. And what we do is take, put down a layer of pesto, some fresh lettuce, Onion and tomato and some fresh pulled chicken and Sylvia. A lot of healthy ingredients here, huh, Freddie? Absolutely. Nothing but the finest for us, right? That's correct, Chef. That's correct. And this is the end result here. And we're using a, um, a roast, uh, rather a uh, sun-dried tomato tortilla here. Um, it's a very healthy item, very attractive. This will be something that we will sell in the cafeteria. Um, and we have an awful lot of response, positive response from that. We also like to work with turkey an awful lot here. And what we have here is a, is a double breast turkey. And I'll just take this and I'm following the bone right down the middle here and just let my knife slide right in. Pull out the meat here. Then I'm gonna follow it around the wishbone this way. And then I have a beautiful turkey breast if I can get it off here. I got it. There we go. Beautiful turkey breast right here. And what I'm going to do is I'll take this breast and I will season it and flatten it out and wrap it. Um, we'll take the other side off right now. And I'll wrap it and then we'll poach it. And the breast will stay together in, in a log shape. Very, very good for uh, carving. Very functional. Um, and you have a very healthy item. We will end up taking the skin off. This, the carcass, we'll make a stock out of, of course. We make our own stocks, chicken stocks, turkey stocks, beef stocks. Let's take the skin right off here. Yeah, we got it. As I said, we'll flatten this out, pound it out a little bit, we'll season it, and then we'll roll it up into a jelly roll style, wrap it up, and then we'll poach it. Benny, we have our final dish here? Okay, that looks wonderful here. We've got our black beans to garnish, a little bit of cheese. We use very little amounts of cheese. Uh, mostly for visual effects more so than have a, a thick gooey mass. And he's got his uh, tomatillo pesto going here and it's just, uh, it looks lovely. You'll cut into this and it will have layers like a lasagna. I feel like I am the most fortunate man in San Diego. I get to come to work in the most beautiful hospital, architecturally speaking, in the United States of America. Able to work with people that want to be here. It, it's really amazing how everybody appreciates being here at Thornton Hospital. Of course, being a chef, I'm an artist, and to have that artistic um, flair and to be able to utilize 
um, the creativity that goes into to being a, a chef um, is, is just a blessing. You know, when a patient comes to a hospital, there are very few things that you can control. You're going to get rolled and stuck when it's time to get rolled and stuck. You're going to get wheeled down for a procedure that might not be real comfortable when it's time for the procedure. But the one thing that you can have a little bit of control on is the food that you eat. And for me to be able to visit with patients and, and get their, their feedback and what they like and what they don't like and to develop menus and recipes that reflect this and to have a, a group of apprentices and a staff that are healthy and happy and glad to be here, all I can say is that um, I feel like I am the luckiest chef in San Diego. And finally tonight, a remembrance of acclaimed artist and UCSD faculty member, Italo Skanga. My mother didn't tell me to become an artist. My father didn't tell me to become an artist, Rosetta. They said they, they wanted me to run a grocery store. They wanted to, me to run a, a work somewhere. You know, that you got to get a job, of course, you know, but not a t artist, you know. And uh, I couldn't be, I didn't know what I always wanted to be. I couldn't be anything else. I couldn't be anything. I was thinking about it. I said, what else could I have been that I wanted to be? Well, I said, well, two things I would have liked to be either a physicist, a musician, or a gardener. <laughs> <laughs> or a cook, maybe. But even now, boy, maybe I could have been also a cook. You see. Hey, Bill, I love the images that you have on these pieces and also on your paintings. They make me nostalgic for Italy and oh, for the things that are familiar. They're to very, me. they're very tell, Italian, aren't they? Me, oh, the cypress trees. Oh and my and God! So much. Tell me a little bit more about that. About yeah. what inspires that and. Yeah. Those images for you? And no, no, that's a good, uh, well, the things I know how to do the best, maybe, you know, nature and the tree, the cypress, which is, uh, you know, here and the mountains, because I tell you, uh, Rosetta, see, there's always a window here. Yes, yeah. That's sometimes uh, to do with my home, my window from my bedroom. Oh. I saw the mountains out there. Oh, when you were young growing up? I was young growing up, and I looked at the window, and I always, mm -hmm. See this this stuff in here that I keep repeating it, you see, and uh, so it's sort of interesting in a way. Uh, the memories, as I said again, the fire in the fireplace and these ceramics that we had in the kitchen, bocale. Uh -huh. See that those are, that's the things uh, and the abstractions, for example, and the, sometimes you notice it's nothing in the center; everything is in the periphery. Mm -hmm. It's either up here. Mm -hmm or um, on the side sometimes, just like flashback in a movie. When you see a movie, for example, you see a lot of flashbacks, what happened in the past. Mm -hmm. uh, same thing with Miami, sometimes it's a flashbacks, mm -hmm. you see. Of growing up and of your life in Italy. Yeah, yeah, tr yeah. Mm -hmm. But I have to invent them, you see. I have to think about it, I have to invent them. Some, mm -hmm. And you have to be careful, you don't want to make it too Sentimental. You have to be very careful when you do that kind of stuff. Otherwise, a lot of, I mean, things happen to a lot of people, you know. I mean, you just have to distill it. You have to speculate and see if there's any possibility of using those things. You were a beautiful spirit, Italo. Strong, enabling, father to five, grandfather to the same number, companion to Sume Yu. You always gave more than we ever could imagine. A consummate artist, you, with one foot anchored in the old world peasant stock of saints and fables, mountains and deeply severe country people dressed in black, suspicious Madonnas and a glinting cross hanging like a wicked blade or a lynched man around the neck and against the dark backdrop of a tunic robe worn by a humble priest in your village of Lego Cosenza, Calabria, Italy, where bony dogs and fear of fear itself were rooted in the soil, where you were born and the new one here of flash and laid back, but cutting edge show and tell new money by the Pacific, new age scientists and engineers who wave checkbooks with no limits sitting under fragrant eucalyptus trees on the campus of UCSD, 
in La Jolla, California, America, where you begin to tangle up everything inside rich profusions, Christ and Pythagoras, trombones and tree trunks, seashells and garish figurines, trinkets you attach to free stambling assemblages, and meta this and meta that, meta, 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 laughter and joy in what you did inside, transmogrified within the kill of your creative imagination. A thing to behold, it expressed itself in a celebration of strong primary colors, deep luminous blues, canary yellows, sunset red oranges, incredible globes, blood red and stunning as those splotched and grown all over the earth. This is one here, of course, and again, same typical me, like you have the abstraction here, you have the tree, the landscape, the ceramic, the uh, Greek architecture here, and the ceramics, and the figure, another tree, uh, tree here again, trying to combine all those elements, uh, nature, figure, architecture, ceramics, see, spots, colors. Um, lots and lots of activities, lots of energy, a lot of contradictions. Mm -hmm. That's typical of me, what I was trying to say before. And I didn't mean to say a little bit of this, a little bit of that. A lot of contradiction in my work. Mm -hmm. See, typical me. Mm -hmm. See, the low, the higher, the middle. A visual poetry for all to see, stroked and fashioned in bold metaphors. Your zany imagination touched any and everything commonplace you sought out and found at flea markets, swamp meets, which you scavenged on weekend mornings like an archaeologist excavating for sacred objects, which you were. You looked for saws, washboards, old beat-up violins, tubas, anything thrown away like an old school globe of the world transformed in your hands into a head or the belly of a stick figure striding through a world where animals are endangered as great music, poetry, or art, a gaunt dog on patrol looking for food inside the hallucinogenic nature of our world, our fears, all these things imagined or real served as grist for the meal in your magical sleight of hand tricks. Now you see it now it's not what you thought you saw for us to move through, made over by your shamanistic, transforming Elan, visions of both old and new worlds. It is. Some images about a gardener here. It's the 19th century. This is very sentimental images. Look. What is it, Rosetta? What are they doing? What? Help me out. They're, um, it looks like they're farmers. You're farmers? Uh, See? Working around. Dead leaves. It's called dead leaves. Is that what it's called? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, dead leaves. I mean, this stuff you find anywhere that people really doesn't pay attention to much anymore. And I, I like the way it looks. I even like the paper. The, fading on the paper, and then you put another image which has nothing to do with the weather whatsoever. Totally a contradiction. And you smear, smear it on them, the way they do it on a press. Then you have this image. You see, I didn't even, I could have retouched this if I wanted to, but I leave, want to leave the line. I want to be that specific there, the, so the cover would show. Oh, the stamps here, the fading of the paper here, see. They're not very, um, you know, people, you know, sometimes you think how people see these things, you know, well, well this is not very popular. People don't, it's hard to understand it, I want think. people to see it? Exactly, you see. Well, I want people just to respond to it, you know. Some people just, it takes time. It takes um, time and you have to be really totally open to certain things and, uh, I mean, to people this would be frustrating. 
It is frustrating. I do like the idea of frustration. <laughs> what color is frustration? <laughs> I don't know. It's a good one. What color? I don't know. Yellow ochre. Yellow ochre. <laughs> Yellow ochre. Yeah. Cubism and folk influences, meta this, meta that, meta, 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 a mode of expression, a kind of transformative rhythm you struck in the way a figure stood, the angle of sculptural language that evoked myth and legend collides into pictures, standing next to cypress trees, their slender branches and leaves flaring like a butane lighter flame, shooting skyward next to a skull, old world drinking jugs made of clay, pottery and ceramics, an old house hovering above chickens glazed in glass, a shoe, a surreal face, and a violin so we wouldn't forget music. You made paintings within paintings, squared off other worlds, bursting with a profusion of colorful dots that exploded into the viewer's vision like the Big Bang of the universe, shooting meteors like a swarm of shotgun pellets. And your studio was a place in and of itself, unique, unbelievable, what you crammed into that space that used to be an old auto shop. Endless cages filled with mad singing birds, taxidermy, old religious relics, all manner of tools and discarded objects you had picked up, stored for later use in your art, which you sometimes hated to sell, so it was crammed there too, along with books and your music which you listen to every morning, operas, arias, sonatas, and that fragrant smell of fruit trees outside in your yard, and all those jars of different olives in your kitchen, with you there stirring the pots like a mad scientist. You were the real deal walking upright on earth, Italo, who didn't check your feelings at whatever door you walked through. And now we all have to deal with the horrible news that you won't be walking through our doors again in the flesh, though your spirit will always remain with us. This is a very good piece. That's wonderful. Uh, my friend, my friend, uh, the Italian friend, uh, Alessandro, loved it. He said it's so irrational, kind of thing. So it'll be like that. I'm not sure about the if I apply more pigment on it, but that's the concept in here. I don't know if I could. It doesn't have any. You really can't explain it. You can't verbalize it. Mm -hmm. Sometimes there's certain things you can't simply verbalize what they mean. All right, now, see, this is, uh, so I'm going to put a little bit more on this. I'm going to do spatter like that uh -huh. sometimes, see? So I like the idea of the dripping uh -huh. in here. Maybe, okay. see, I like it real thick, like, so it drips down, see, like this. That's, yeah. that's what I had in mind. Uh -huh. Real gooky, uh -huh. real kind of not about paint. It's about kind of a, well, it's about color, but it's color that really doesn't, uh, related to the work, mm -hmm. so very, very s expressive, very sloppy, see? So, kind of blue skin, blue armor. Yeah. Yeah. Look at that. <laughs> I told David, I said, leave the stuff on it, don't mix it, don't take the impurities out of the paint. Yeah. You can go back in 
guilty of feeling of irrationality, but also one of being trapped. Is that what? Is that what yeah, yeah, sort of being trapped and being sort of awkward. And look, I mean, everything is really wrong. Like the uh, the arms are wrong in here. Mm -hmm. it seems to be it's sort of a neutral, sort of a really gender. I mean, uh, sexless. You know, yeah. it doesn't. It's weird thing. I mean, uh, um, so. So that's what I was trying to do, emphasize that more. Instead of I make it better, uh -huh. maybe I make it worse. Uh -huh. <laughs> Perhaps, I don't know. Uh, so it's really hard sometimes, uh, it's very hard to verbalize it. Well, I had this in mind for years to do it, Rosetta. I bought this and I knew I was going to do it the, the day that I bought them. It's been now six years. And I says I could never had enough, uh, I don't know if a courage or what it is to just put it together. Mm -hmm. The other day I said, David, let's try this. I said, David, my, my helper, I said, let's do it. And he said, sure, 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 let's put it together. She said, if you can put a screw from the bottom, and mm -hmm. then it would fabricate the structure here, so it really holds it up together very well. Something, again, the opposite, the contrast, that's very, very awkward, very primitive, and very folksy, to this sort of very mechanical thing in the back, that, that duality about to work again and this very crazy robe. I had it for years, this robe. I, said, I could never be able to use it and I finally came to the conclusion to use it. So all these things come together, like you set them up, you wait, you know, when the time comes and then you use those objects that accumulate. Sometimes I just, you know, don't use it. But I, had, I wanted to do this for the beginning or the day that I purchased the pieces here. It's hard to decide when it's finished. The how hardest you, thing to how do. How do you know when it's finished? Yeah, you don't know. You don't know when it's finished. Exactly. Same thing. Students have a hell of a time know when it's finished. And when you start, they don't know when it's finished. Nobody really knows when it's finished. It's up to me to decide when it's finished. See, that's the trouble. That's the thing with art. There's not really any scientific steps. You could go from one next to the other. You just have to do it by intuition and by feeling. Maybe it works. Too much. Okay, that's enough. When I ended the class here at UCSD, I said, uh, you know, there's so much strife between religion, you know. This, I told you that story about religion, the, uh, about religion, you know, about the Protestants and the, and the Roman Catholics during the, Rena during the Renaissance with Martin Luther and the, and I said, the Muslims and the, with the Christians. There's so much strife. I said, it's so bad, in other words. And I said, and then I was flushing back myself to the 17th, 16th century. And I said, well, the really heroes, I said, they weren't really those people who fought the ideologies. They were the artists. I said, Bernini, I said, look at the, tr the things he built. Look at this incredible architecture. He's the hero, you see? I said, I, look, I said, look at the Karachi and the beautiful painting, you know? And I, just, I said, oh, anyway, and Widorani, and I mentioned some of the artists that I like so much. And he said, they were the true artists, you see? Under the strifle thing, they came through. They, they made those beautiful objects for us to really look at and enjoy. They became immortal. And everybody started to clap. They thought they liked it. I made the artist the hero. You have to have a lot of courage, you know, to change it, to move it, see? And uh, simplify it, put more on it, add, subtract. Those are the decisions, and it becomes very formal. That's the formal elements of art. You need more red, more blue. How do you make the composition? What kind of texture? 
what kind of scale, how high, should be human height, architectural height. Those are things you think about sometimes, sometimes all the time. You have to go beyond the idea what that's a tree, it's a figure, it's about um, eyes, it's about cold, perhaps, you know. And you look at the pigment, the, the way it's painted, the, the lines, the black lines and the red. If you want to, you see, you can't be lazy. If you don't want to, you just bypass it. I mean, that's the beautiful thing about the visual arts. You see, you can just bypass it if you don't like it. If it doesn't affect you. If it moves, it's got to move you. If it doesn't move you, then it doesn't have an impact.